no implications for your um, medical care as well. And Starfire can help. So what are the topics I'm going to be addressing? So first, what is genetic counseling and testing? When is genetic counseling appropriate? What's genetic about ovarian cancer? What can genetic counseling and testing tell you about your cancer risk? And what can be done to minimize that risk? And what are the benefits and limitations of genetic counseling and testing? And then I'm going to review a little bit about Charchera and our Genetics for Life program as well as um, our ovarian cancer program. Oops, there we go. So what is genetic counseling? And this definition is taken straight from the National Society of Genetic Counselors website. I'm just going to read it out to you. Genetic counseling is the process of helping people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease. This process integrates interpretation of family and medical history to assess the chance of disease occurrence or recurrence, education about inheritance, testing, management, prevention, resources, and research, and counseling to promote informed choices and adaptation to the risk or condition. So that's quite a mouthful. Um, but really what it means is that it's more than just about the information. It's about um, making decisions and what you and your family are going to do um, with that information and how it applies to you specifically. And it empowers you to understand your hereditary cancer risk. In this case, we're talking about hereditary cancer risk. It empowers you to make informed decisions, like I said, about genetic testing, so really learning um, what it could tell you, what genetic testing could not tell you, um, and understand what can be done to manage your own risk um, and protect you and your family's health, as well as assess what factors in your own life, whether it be um, religion or personality or um, you know how your family structure is or where you're from, um, may influence decision making around genetics. And then it will also empower you to develop a plan to move forward. So just a little bit of an introduction. Um, if we can, and, and just forget about ovarian cancer or breast cancer, or any specific type of cancer for a moment. But if we take a step back and look at all cancers that are diagnosed in any given year, let's say, in the US, we know that most of the time, those cancers are not hereditary. So about 90 to 95% of the time, people are always surprised to hear that cancers are sporadic, whether that be due to environmental causes or part of the normal aging process or other factors that we really can't say. Um, and they're really only 5 to 10% of the time are cancers hereditary. And so one um, specific, um, and, and you know, there are many, many hereditary cancer syndromes, but obviously tonight we're going to be talking about the genetics of ovarian cancer. And so I'd like to begin with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome since um, that is one of the most common hereditary cancer syndromes um, and, you know, the most well-known syndrome. So, um, again, we're taking a step back. Really, what are genes? Our genes are essentially a set of instructions for our body to function properly. Um, you know, we, we all have an estimated 20,000 genes in our body, and they're important. They really provide a roadmap or a blueprint for our body to function. And you can kind of think of each gene as a long string of letters or a sentence. And our body reads through that sentence and gives it instructions. So um, in this case, what the body does is it reads through it like a sentence, and it produces a protein. And there are two specific genes called BRCA1 and BRCA2, or some people refer to them as BRCA1 and BRCA2, that are important genes that I'm going to be talking about in relation to hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. So um, these two genes are actually genes that we all have. We all have BRCA1. We all have BRCA2. They should be there, and they should be working. Their job is to protect us against breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So we call these tumor suppressor genes because their job is to suppress tumors. 
specifically breast and ovarian tumors. However, sometimes in families what can happen is that these genes aren't working properly. They carry what's called a mutation. So what is a mutation? It's essentially a spelling error. So if you look um, to the box in the bottom of this slide, you see on the left the normal working copy of the gene has the spelling CG. So the body reads through that, produces a protein, you know, it's working just fine. However, if there's a mutation or spelling error, so instead of CG on the right, you can see it says AT. So that's a misspelling. So the body can't read through that quite as well. And so it produces a protein that's not working, and so, um, or not working quite as well. And so therefore, there's decreased protection against breast and ovarian cancer. And that's where the increased risk for cancer comes from. So, um, you know, these genes are long genes. They're, it's a long sentence. There are many places where errors or mutations can exist. There are greater than 800 mutations that can be found in these two genes. Um, and specifically with Ashkenazi Jews or Eastern European Jews, we know that there's three specific mutations or three specific places on these genes um, where mutations can be found. And so what are the things that we look for in families to help us determine how likely we think the cancer is hereditary? So when we're looking to see how likely do we think that a BRCA mutation will be found in a particular family, there are risk factors that we look for. So the first thing we look for is early onset breast cancer or ovarian cancer or really any cancer. Um, any cancer diagnosed earlier than the age of 50, we'd consider early onset. We also look for multiple individuals in multiple generations on the same side of the family diagnosed with the same cancer. So in this case, we're looking for multiple individuals who've had ovarian cancer or multiple individuals who've had breast cancer running through the same side of the family. We also look for the presence of ovarian cancer, so even just one relative in the context of a family history of breast cancer, that raises our suspicion. And then we also look for multiple primary related cancers in the same woman. So in this case, it would be breast cancer and ovarian cancer, or a woman who's had two primary breast cancers. And what I, what I mean by that is not a cancer that spread, but two separate cancers. So that would raise our suspicion. We also look for male breast cancer, so that's pretty unusual. And then we, of course, also look for Ashkenazi Jewish hair. That's true for the reasons I mentioned before. Now, how are these mutations passed down in the family? So um, they're passed down in what we call an autosomal dominant fashion which means that you only ever need one copy of the gene to not be working. If you take a look at this picture, you'll see um, what's, you know, this is basically a picture of all of our genetic information. These are called chromosomes, these long, thin structures. And each chromosome has many, many genes on it. And you can see that they're paired off. And the reason they're paired off is because we have one from mom and one from dad. So we all have two copies of every gene. And you can also see that this individual is a male because he has an X and a Y chromosome. A female would have an X and an X chromosome. Now, BRCA1 is located on chromosome 17, and BRCA2 is located on chromosome 13. The reason I point this out is because it's a common misconce misconception that women are the only ones who can carry mutations. And actually, that's not true. Um, Men can carry mutations just as often as women do, and they inherit that from men and women, and they can pass them on to sons and daughters. So um, they're completely separate from the sex chromosomes, you know, the X and the Y, because they're located on chromosomes 17 and 13. So just a few case examples to illustrate my point. Um, if you take a look here at the little family history, and circles are females and squares are males, um, the family history is really the tool that we use in genetic risk assessment to help us figure out, um, you know, if there's a particular pattern in the family. So if we take this situation, the arrow is pointing to Sherry, a 42-year-old woman 
who schedules an appointment with a genetic counselor because she's concerned about her risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So you can see here in her family, um, the individual shaded in, in pink have been diagnosed with breast cancer, and you can see their ages of diagnosis. And um, Sherry's sister was diagnosed with ovarian cancer at age 35. Um, and so in their discussion of genetic testing, the genetic counselor asks her if her mother or sister would be interested in genetic testing first. Now, why would the genetic counselor ask Sherry, um, if Sherry's a patient, why would, why would the genetic counselor ask Sherry um, if her sister or mother would want to test first? And the reason for that is because we, in, in families with cancer, we like to test the person who's actually been diagnosed with cancer. If she tests Sherry in this situation and she tests negative, we don't know if it's because her mom and her sister maybe do carry a mutation and she just didn't inherit it, or whether the cancers are being caused by some other gene mutation, or are the cancers in the family truly sporadic or random. And so testing Sherry doesn't really give us the full picture and it doesn't really give us a full answer. Second case example. We take a look at Debbie here. The arrow is pointing to Debbie. She's a 54-year-old woman who was diagnosed with ovarian cancer at age 50. At her follow-up, her oncologist recommends that she go for genetic counseling to discuss the risk for her two daughters. And Debbie's actually surprised because the cancers in her family are all on her father's side. So if we take a look, um, her father is the square, and her uh, paternal aunt and cousin are the ones who've been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, but like I mentioned before, you know, men can carry mutations just as often as women do. They inherit them from mothers and fathers, and they can pass them on to sons and daughters. So what are the lifetime risks if you do carry a BRCA mutation? Um, we, we quote the lifetime risk for developing a breast cancer to be between 60 and 80 um, percent. The risk for a second breast cancer would be between 40 and 65 percent. And the risk for ovarian cancer we quote to be between 15 and 60 percent. And these are wide ranges because there have been many studies done, um, and these, these numbers just pull those statistics together. So, and actually the risk may be slightly lower for women who carry a BRCA2 mutation as opposed to a BRCA1 mutation. And they may vary due to a variety of other factors. There are also some other cancer-related risks associated with BRCA. So like I mentioned, um, male breast cancer is very unusual. So when we see that in families, that definitely raises a red flag. Um, and then there is also a slightly increased risk for prostate cancer for men. Um, some other cancers which are lesser associated with uh, BRCA mutations are pancreatic cancer, and melanoma, and then there are also other associations with other cancers being studied. So what are the options if you do carry a BRCA mutation? And I know Dr. Zorn will be going into more detail um, about this, so I'll just briefly mention it. One option is to do increased surveillance, um, specifically to manage breast cancer risk. So the medical recommendations would be a breast MRI, and a mammogram alternating every six months along with clinical breast exams and self-breast exams. One option also is surgery. So some women consider doing a prophylactic mastectomy or a preventative removal of their breast tissue with or without reconstruction. And this significantly reduces the risk of breast cancer. Um, another option for surgery in terms of managing ovarian cancer risk is a salpingo oophorectomy, or removal of the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, which, again, significantly reduces the risk of developing ovarian cancer. Um, one other option is chemo prevention. So there are medications out there, and you know I would just encourage people to talk to their doctor about their options. Um, and oral contraceptives have been shown when taken for a certain period of time to decrease the risk of developing ovarian cancer. Um, and like I said, you know, if someone carries a BRCA mutation, they should always be consulting, um, you know, with a doctor and consider the risks, benefits, and limitations of all of these, um, all of these options. Hmm. Looks like that. 
That's why they're stuck. I'm not sure what's going on here. Here we go. Okay. Um, second syndrome I'd like to address. So we, we already talked about hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Now I'd like to briefly touch on Lynch syndrome, um, which is also known as hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. There we go. Um, so what are the clinical features of Lynch syndrome? So actually the highest risk in Lynch syndrome um, is for early onset colorectal cancer. So that really is the hallmark feature of Lynch syndrome. And those uh, colon cancers are mostly right-sided, so that's a finding that we tend to find in Lynch syndrome. And then of course there are risks for, risks for other cancers, including endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, stomach cancer, amongst others. So um, what are the genetics of Lynch syndrome? So Lynch syndrome is also what we call autosomal dominant, which means you only ever need one copy of a gene mutation to have Lynch syndrome. So remember, we, get, we have two copies of every gene, one from mom and one from dad. So having one copy with a mutation on it is enough to have Lynch syndrome. And these, uh, the genes in Lynch syndrome are mismatch repair genes. They're what we call mismatch repair genes. So it's kind of like another um, type of tumor suppressor where their job is to prevent tumors from happening. Um, and you know, these are all genes that we want to be there and they, we want them to be working properly. Um, but again, you know, very similar to BRCA1 and 2, what we're really looking for in Lynch syndrome is to see if someone has a mutation. And there are five genes that are associated with Lynch syndrome. And these genes are listed here. MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, PMS2, and FCAM. And I know that's a mouthful, but um, those are all of the genes that we know are associated with Lynch syndrome. So how do we test for Lynch syndrome? And there really, there really is two types of testing. So um, you know, similar to BRCA1 and 2, we can do DNA testing. So we can actually look at the genes and read through letter by letter to look for mutations. But um, in Lynch syndrome, often what we do is in individuals who have a cancer, um, we can actually test the tumor. So that's really the first step. Um, and this really, this only applies to colon and endometrial tumors. It does not apply to um, ovarian tumors. So um, they can actually test the tumor to see if there are proteins that are missing and that directs the genetic testing. So that can tell us which gene is missing in the tumor itself. And then we can say, okay, that's the gene. Since there are five genes, that's a lot of genes. So then it'll tell us which gene to do testing for. So again, this chart represents what, the, what are the lifetime risks um, for cancer associated with Lynch syndrome. So you can see here the highest one is for colorectal cancer, um, which we quote a lifetime risk of 82%. Um, endometrial cancer is 60%. And then down here at the bottom, you can see that the lifetime risk for uh, ovarian cancer is 12%. And again, talk to your doctor about your options in terms of increased surveillance for colorectal cancer, so we recommend um, colonoscopies every every year or every one to two years, um, and surgical options as well. And so, really, just stepping back, so what is so really family history is the most important tool for assessing your risk. So when you're going for genetic counseling and testing. The information that you need is individuals in your family who have had cancer. So who was it? Was it your aunt? Was it your grandmother? Was it your uncle? Who had cancer? What type of cancer was it? And what was the age of diagnosis? And it's helpful to sometimes bring records, you know, other medical records, pathology reports, death certificates. These can all be helpful. And remember that family history from both sides of the family is important because men can carry mutations too. 
So sometimes people think about um, when they're considering genetic counseling and testing, um, they consider insurance. So insurance can definitely be a, ta a challenge in terms of cost and coverage. And I will just say that each insurance company has their own um, criteria about when they will and won't cover uh, genetic testing. And genetic counselors and doctors are very used to dealing with insurance companies um, when they're ordering genetic testing. So um, I would just recommend meeting with a genetic counselor to discuss um, to discuss that and they can help you work out that piece of things. Some people are also concerned about insurance discrimination and just to touch on that briefly, there was a federal law called GINA which was enacted in 2008 which protects against um, health insurance and um, employer discrimination but it does not protect against life insurance long-term care or disability. So um, that's just one some of the limitations of GINA. And so what are some of the benefits of genetic counseling and testing? So um, I always say, you know, it really gives you options to move forward, to um, make some medical decisions about surveillance. Um, you know, it, some people describe the relief of knowing. It can inform, like I said, decision making. And it also facilitates communication with family members. So obviously in genetics, this information doesn't only just apply to you, it also applies to family members. And um, it can also identify non-carriers in families. So if we identify who in the family is carrying the mutation, that means we can also test other family members um, and identify non-carriers. What are some of the challenges of genetic counseling and testing? Uh, like I mentioned, cost and insurance coverage can be a challenge. Sometimes people think about the emotional or psychological implications. So um, what we call survivor guilt people feel where one individual has a mutation and another doesn't. Um, some people may feel guilty for passing on a gene and of course you know what we pass on is not in our control. Um, women who test negative still do have a risk for cancer. So um, you know everyone has a risk for cancer and there's no way you can eliminate that. Um, and then of course testing does not detect all of the mutations. No testing is perfect. So what are the next steps for you? Um, you know, the choice to pursue genetic counseling and testing is a very personal one, and I would just encourage you all to know your family history, ask those questions, um, you know, meet with a genetic counselor, and ultimately we're made of more than just our genes. It can provide important health information uh, to take action for you and your family, um, but we are more than, than just our genes, and I would say to definitely join Shersheret's National Ovarian Cancer Program to receive free information and resources. And um, after this talk, I, of course, am available to if anyone has specific questions about their individual you know, personal or family history, I'd be more than happy to speak with them. Um, and I can be reached at Charchette at this number and uh, connect with us on our website, on our blog, Facebook and Twitter, as well as YouTube. So um, you know, thank you so much, and I'd like to turn this back over to uh, Dr. Thorne. Great, thank you so much. And there we go. I will um, get started with my slides and jump right in so that we have time to leave questions, time for questions at the end. Liliana, do I have control of the slides? Go ahead. OK. So I'm going to be talking about the risk for, genetic, uh, for gynecologic cancer in women with BRCA and Lynch syndrome mutations, and also review the current recommendations for genetic counseling and testing in these patients. Um, I want to emphasize that we're going to be talking about ovarian, fallopian tube, and peritoneal cancer. Even though we often use ovarian cancer as the umbrella term for that, they are all related cancers that fall under that uh, umbrella. And we'll also review the options for prevention and early diagnosis of hereditary GYN cancer. I don't have, OK. Um, the general population risk for developing cancer is about 1 in 70 in American women uh, getting ovarian cancer during her lifetime. About 1 in 8 women gets breast cancer during her lifetime. So in general, ovarian cancer is actually a relatively rare cancer. 
Um, if you think better in percentages than you do in fractions, that means that the baseline risk for ovarian cancer in an American woman is about 1.4%, while the baseline risk for breast cancer is about 12.5%. So uh, the, when we think about a family history of ovarian cancer, if you have one first-degree relative, a first-degree relative is a mother, a sister, or a daughter who's had ovarian cancer, that roughly doubles your risk of developing ovarian cancer in your lifetime, which sounds awful when you put it that way, but if you put it back into perspective with those numbers, it means a 1 in 35 lifetime risk or roughly a 3% lifetime risk for ovarian cancer. And again, to help put that in perspective, the lifetime risk for pancreatic cancer in the U.S. is about 1.3%, and I think we would all agree that pancreatic cancer is a relatively rare cancer. The lifetime risk for colon cancer is 5%, and the lifetime risk for prostate cancer for men is actually 15%, so it's even higher than the risk for breast cancer in women. When we think about uh, the germline mutations, and what I mean by germline mutation is that is a, a mutation in the genes that's carried from birth. It's not a mutation that develops over a person's lifetime. We've actually had some data that's come out in the last couple of years that's been very um, informative about this. We often think about the vast majority of cancers being sporadic, as Danielle had mentioned, but we now have new evidence both for ovarian cancer and for breast cancer that roughly 24% of them are caused by mutations in tumor suppressor genes. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are the um, best known examples of this, but there's a whole host of other genes not quite as commonly found as BRCA1 and 2, but there's a panel of up to 30 genes now that have been found to be associated with hereditary ovarian cancer. And what's interesting about many of these subjects who were tested is that a third of them had no family history of ovarian cancer. And again, 35% of them were older than age 60 at diagnosis. So some of our traditional hallmarks of hereditary cancers that Danielle had discussed, um, young age at diagnosis, a strong family history, um, those aren't always proving to be true. And they've um, meant that we've needed to broaden our scope, I think, as we think about uh, testing for hereditary mutations. BRCA1 and BRCA2, as I mentioned, are both tumor suppressor genes, and what that means is they act as the brakes on cell growth and division in our bodies. Um, there are other genes called oncogenes that are accelerators. Uh, they're like the gas pedal in the car, but tumor suppressor genes are the brakes on cell growth and division. So when they're lost, cell growth and division can um, happen unimpeded, as you can imagine, with cancer. These are mutations, very importantly, that are associated with increased cancer risk in adulthood. These are not associated with childhood cancers. And as Danielle had mentioned, there can be other sites beyond breast and ovarian cancer that can be associated. Um, again, just to emphasize, I know we've hit this point already, but we really want to drive it home. This is an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, which means that a parent of either sex can pass a mutation on to a child of either sex. And the reason why this is so important is it's very natural for people when we're talking about breast and ovarian cancer, since these are female cancers, to only think about the maternal side of the family. But as, as, as in this example here, the father is the one who's affected by a mutation. And since his children have a 50-50 chance of inheriting it, he has one affected son and one affected daughter. So as Danielle had emphasized, we really have to think about the father's side of the family as well as the mother's. And this is uh, just a little bit more information about drawing those uh, family trees. We think about people who are first degree family um, members. Those are people who are related by one step away in a family chart like this. And then we have second degree family members who are two steps away and third degree family members who are three steps away. And so this just gives you an idea of how a genetic counselor would work with you to map out your family's history and um, try to assess your risk. People who are known to be at high risk for gynecologic cancer carry a mutation that's already been identified or have a family history of breast and ovarian cancer that involves an early age of onset bilateral, that is both sides of the breast being affected by breast cancer. They've had more than one cancer or they've had male breast cancer in their family or as Danielle did such a good job of explaining, they have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. 
We have to remember, though, when we're talking about um, family history, that breast cancer is a very common cancer. So most women will have had a relative with the disease, but only about 25% of breast cancer is hereditary. So in many families, that is sporadic cancer. It is not hereditary cancer. We also have to remember that there's other syndromes that can involve breast and GYN cancers, Lynch syndrome, as we're going to talk about some more. Um, also, Lee Fromini and Cowden syndrome can have breast, and, uh, breast cancers and GYN tumors involved in them. The other thing that we have to think about with um, genes is that they can have what we call variable expressivity and incomplete penetrance, which means essentially that they can act differently in different family members. The same mutation may or may not be expressed in a family member, or it may be expressed in a different way. One sister may have ovarian cancer while another has breast cancer, while a third is not affected by cancer at all, and we really don't understand why those differences exist yet. We also have families that have a very limited knowledge of their family history, what I call the cancer down there phenomenon, where women are generally pointing to their general uh, abdominal area. And a cancer down there could be GYN in origin, but it could also be bladder cancer or colon cancer or any number of other cancers that have nothing to do with the GYN tract. We also have families that have relatively few women in the families, and so there's a, not a whole lot of opportunity for BRCA mutations to express themselves. So sometimes that complicates the picture. When you get the test result back from genetic testing, a positive result in some ways is the easiest one to interpret. It means that they found a mutation, and we have um, pretty concrete ideas about how to manage that risk, and we have guidelines to help um, direct that. When you have a negative result, meaning that no mutation is found, that means that there's a reduced likelihood that there's an inherited cancer susceptibility. And we do um, have guidelines about how to manage people based on their personal and family history of cancer. One of the more complicated sy sy situations is when a variant is found. This is an, um, a misspelling in the gene, but it's not known to um, have a negative effect. It's not known to be associated with cancer definitively, and so we have to be very careful in the management stra uh, strategies that we recommend in that scenario. And because this is complicated, I think that's why it's so important to um, involve a genetic counselor in your testing. We have a U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which many of you might be familiar with based on the controversies over how frequently to do mammograms. But they've also looked at this issue of offering genetic testing. And I, I know this is a complicated slide, but I just want to emphasize that they strategize based on whether women have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry or not when they first developed guidelines in 2005. But in the meantime, we've had an update to these guidelines. Can you go to the next slide, please? Which is the NCCN guidelines. And these have now recommended that any woman with a history of epithelial ovarian, fallopian tube, or peritoneal cancer has genetic counseling and testing. It is not dependent on having family history of cancer. It is not dependent on ethnicity, such as being of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, and is not dependent on having a particular type of tumor pathology, such as serous histology. So really, the recommendation is that all women with one of those cancers undergo genetic counseling and testing because we feel the risk of carrying a mutation is high enough that it merits the testing and the impact for that patient and her family members is so significant. Next slide. When you do BRCA1 and 2 mutation testing, as Danielle alluded to, we generally test the person who is most likely to carry the mutation. So we test the family member who's already affected by cancer. This person is the most likely to have insurance coverage for the testing, and it may impact her care directly, such as deciding about a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy, whether she should have her tubes and ovaries removed, and whether she wants to participate in a trial for experimental drugs called PARP inhibitors that are um, suggested to have increased activity in people who carry BRCA mutations. We also um, can test subsequent family members much more um, efficiently because their testing will be less expensive if the mutation is found in that affected family member purse. We do not test children under the age of 18, again, because they're not at increased risk for cancer at that age, and we feel like we want children to be old enough to be considered adults and make the decision for themselves whether they want to be tested or not. Next slide. Um, your risk of ov developing ovarian cancer increases gradually over time. The risk is relatively low when you're in your 20s, for example, and then gradually increases as you move through life. 
The peak age of diagnosis is still in the 50s and 60s, but we do see cases that are diagnosed in the late 30s and 40s, and so that's why our guidelines have evolved. Uh, next slide. And in the interest of time, I'm going to go on to the next slide. So our screening guidelines right now for ovarian cancer are that in the general population, that is people who are not known to carry BRCA mutations or to have a strong family history, that no screening is recommended. In the high-risk population, CA125 blood tests and pelvic ultrasounds can be done every 6 to 12 months. Um, but I have to stress that these have never been shown to have a survival benefit in the high-risk population. Next slide. Because screening is not particularly effective, we focus quite a bit on prevention options. Birth control pills are the most effective form of prevention that we have for um, ovarian cancer short of proceeding with surgery. There's about a 50% risk reduction with five years of birth control pill use, and this seems to carry over into mutation carriers as it does for the general population. There's a possible slight increased risk of breast cancer, but when we're talking about BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers whose lifetime risk for breast cancer is already so high, it's not clear that this risk is really significantly increased based on the use of birth control pills. Next slide. So really, prevention for ovarian cancer is based on removing the tubes and ovaries. That surgery is called a bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, or BSO for short. It can include a hysterectomy, but it doesn't have to include a hysterectomy. It's associated with a 95% risk reduction for ovarian and fallopian tube cancer, and it also is associated with a decreased risk for breast cancer. So about a 50% decreased risk for breast cancer in a woman who has her fallopian tubes and ovaries removed premenopausally. Next slide. Many women have questions about the timing of surgery, and generally what we say is that after the age of 35 or once childbearing is complete is the time to proceed with the bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. If a woman knows that she wants to do both a prophylactic mastectomy, here abbreviated as PM, and a prophylactic BSO, my general advice is to them is to go ahead with the prophylactic mastectomy first. And the reason for that is several fold. The first is that their overall lifetime risk for breast cancer is much higher than their risk for ovarian cancer, so you want to focus your risk reduction efforts there first. You can also have breast cancer develop at a much earlier age than ovarian cancer, so we tend to want to, um, again, focus our preventative efforts at the younger age there first. And also, you can have your prophylactic mastectomy while you're still um, bearing children. It doesn't interfere with childbearing, where obviously having your ovaries removed now makes you infertile. Um, some women ask questions about whether the two surgeries can be combined. The best answer for that, obviously, is going to depend on a woman's individual circumstances. But in general, if you know that you want to have a breast reconstruction after the mastectomy, you can't combine the BSO with it um, because it makes for a very long day in the operating room and potentially increases the risk of infection in the reconstructed breast. You also specifically can't do it if you're having a hysterectomy at the time of your BSO, also because of uh, questions about possibly increased risk of infection. Next slide. And really, the main side effect of the removal of the tubes and ovaries is the menopause that it causes. And when we're talking about women doing this as young as 35, that's roughly 15 years before the average age of menopause onset at 50, 51 in the United States. Clearly, estrogen is the most effective treatment for being uh, menopausal, but not all patients are candidates to take estrogen replacement. It's a complicated question, and it really revolves very much around an individual person's circumstances, but some of the key questions are whether the person has already had a breast cancer diagnosis, and if she has, what was the hormone receptor status of that breast cancer? If it had estrogen and progesterone receptors, then generally she is not considered to be a candidate to take hormone replacement after the BSO. If she's had a prior hysterectomy, this can also factor into it. If the uterus is still there, then the woman needs progestin as well as the uh, estrogen to help protect the uterus against the effects of the estrogen. But if she's already had a hysterectomy, she can take estrogen alone. And when women are candidates for hormone replacement, what we generally recommend is to take the lowest possible dose until, again, the average age of menopause, which is 50-51. This is not lifetime hormone replacement. The goal of it is to get them through to a more natural age of menopause to try to help not only with the symptoms of menopause, but the other side effects of menopause, such as bone health and um, heart health issues. 
there, for women who aren't candidates for hormones or simply don't want to take them, there are non-hormonal medications that can help with the symptoms of menopause, and there are even some non-medicinal interventions such as exercise, meditation, and acupuncture, as well as weight loss that have been shown to decrease symptoms. Next slide. Um, I'm going to move through this one and go to the next slide and just briefly mention Lynch syndrome. Next slide. Again, to reiterate, we have a baseline risk for ovarian cancer of about 1.4%. Our baseline risk in the United States for endometrial cancer is about 3%. It's a more common cancer. Next slide. And as we talked about before, there are genes that are associated with Lynch syndrome. These, again, are tumor suppressor genes, but they work in a slightly different pathway called the mismatch repair pathway. But again, just like with BRCA1 and 2, these are mutations associated with increased cancer risk in adulthood. Um, colon and endometrial are clearly the dominant cancers here. As a woman with Lynch syndrome mutations, it's a 50-50 shot which one is going to show up first. But ovarian cancer can happen. Next slide. The current guidelines have now recommended screening for um, uh, Lynch syndrome mutation carriers, which includes colonoscopy, endometrial biopsy, pelvic ultrasound, and um, screening with cytology uh, for bladder cancer as well. They've now also included the idea that prophylactic surgery with removal of the uterus and the tubes and ovaries can be efficacious. With Lynch syndrome, it is now important that the hysterectomy be an automatic part of the procedure since endometrial cancer is one of the main risks. Next slide. And that's going to wrap us up in time to take some questions. Right now, we're, um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. We want to make sure these questions are general. Um, just type them in, and um, we'll go through them and uh, ask either Dr. Zorn or uh, Danielle to answer them. Okay, we have one question, um, and is there a way, one second, uh, um, and I don't know, this is more of a general question, has there been any research on um, any environmental link between estrogens and ovarian cancer? Um, this is um, Kristen Zorn. I'll take that question. Um, I, I'm not completely sure what the question um, is coming from, but there's some thoughts that because of changes in our lifestyles, we have a longer exposure to hormones. Um, for example, we tend to um, get our periods at a younger age now than women have historically in the past. We tend to have fewer children. Um, we tend to um, have prolonged exposure to our own natural hormones, and then we also potentially have increased exposure to hormones through other sources in our environment, and that can include anything from our food chain with animals that are exposed to extra hormones um, to things like BPA and water bottles and all. So we don't have definitive evidence that that has made a difference in ovarian cancer risks, um, but it is one of the areas of, of research right now. Um, here's another question. It's more related to genetic uh, testing. What if a person that has been diagnosed um, has passed away? Uh, that, I'll take that one. This is Danielle. That's actually a great question. Um, you know, there are definitely limitations uh, to family histories, as Dr. Zorn um, mentioned. There can be many uh, limitations. So. For example, um, not having records or, uh, you know, family members are long gone and we don't know, you know, what age they were diagnosed or what was their cause of death or, um, you know, what cancer they were diagnosed with or, um, you know, even, you know, some individuals come for genetic counseling and they say, I was adopted and so there is no family history. and so. 
um, really at that point we have to work with whatever information we have. Um, family history is key, so it definitely is a tool that we use. Um, but we also, like Dr. Zorn mentioned, uh, genetic counseling and testing is recommended for any person who, uh, or any woman who has ovarian cancer. So really we just work with whatever information we have and just understanding the limitations of testing someone who's not had cancer. So obviously we can do that. Um, and, you know, if the people who've had cancer have passed away, obviously we can test someone who has not had cancer. It's just understanding what that means. So it may mean that that person did carry a mutation, the family member who passed did carry a mutation and you just didn't inherit it, or they carry a different gene mutation, or their cancer truly was a sporadic cancer. So just understanding that there are multiple interpretations that could be made from that type of testing. Okay, I have another question in regards to genetic testing. Um, if I received a BRC1 and 2 testing and received a negative mutation, is counseling still advisable? So another great question. Um, I would definitely recommend keeping in touch with your genetic counselor because there have been some changes to the testing. So as uh, you know, Dr. Zorn mentioned, there have been some updates to the testing, and now we know that there are more genes that have been associated with hereditary ovarian cancer. Um, and there are also different technologies that can be used to look at the BRCA gene. So it really depends when the testing was done. Um, and because, you know, like I said, the technology has changed and it's moving so rapidly, and we're now discovering many genes, and, and things change as time moves on. So I would say check back with a genetic counselor, or you know, if you have any questions about your personal circumstance, I'd be more than happy to speak with you. Um, and, and you can give me a call at Sherrod, and I'm happy to, uh, to discuss your personal and family history. And I think the other component there that sometimes comes up, there are families that we are very concerned based on the family history of breast and ovarian cancer. Um, but we aren't able to identify mutation. We test people and we don't identify mutation, but we're still very concerned that these are families that do have a hereditary predisposition to cancer. So some of those families, we go ahead and counsel them as if they carried mutations and we offer them increased screening and prevention options. So I think it's very important to talk through your personal situation with someone who's very knowledgeable about this high-risk area. We have some folks who are sometimes getting tested by physicians where this isn't particularly their area of expertise, and sometimes they don't you know, know all the nuances of the situation. And so if you are at all concerned about your family history, even in the presence of a, of a test that comes back and says a mutation hasn't been de detected, then I think it's really important to talk to a genetic counselor or a clinician who really works with people in this high-risk arena regularly. Dr. Thorne, I think this question is for you. What are the side effects of having um, early BSO and hysterectomy? Sure. So the, the side effects, the obvious ones that people think about are um, the hot flashes, the night sweats, the various sexual side effects of early uh, menopause. From a medical standpoint, the other thing that we have to worry about is um, early onset of osteoporosis or thinning of the bones and early onset of heart disease. We know that women who go through an early menopause are at higher risk for this. And so that's why I'm so careful to try to see if a person is a candidate for hormone replacement. Um, if they are not a candidate for hormone replacement, then obviously we can monitor for osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease and treat it, treat them with, uh, you know, the medical interventions that are available for those. But um, if people are candidates for estrogen, it really is the best way to help prevent those side effects. Here's another question. If the testing of a person who has ovarian cancer tests negative, do her daughters still need to be tested? The short answer to that is no, um, because you can't pass on something that you don't have. Again, I would just want to make sure that that testing was done, like Dr. Zorn mentioned, um, with a qualified professional, genetic professional who's used to dealing with it and just making sure that the appropriate tests um, are being ordered. 
And like Dr. Zorn mentioned, you know, just based on family history, we might tell that person um, just by the fact that your mother had ovarian cancer slightly does increase your risk um, because we can't ever rule out that there's some other gene out there that we just haven't discovered yet. Um, you know, and so just based on family history, there would be slightly increased risk. But no, we wouldn't test um, a child for something that the parent doesn't have because the parent um, can't pass on something they don't have unless, um, you know, the mother's, unless the child's father has a family history. And so we'd start thinking about the father's side of the family. Here's another question that's on those lines. My mom and aunt both were diagnosed with ovarian cancer. My mom received genetic testing and did not get her results. My aunt came back ne negative. Could my mom still be positive? The short answer to that is yes. Um, you know, again, it's not likely given that, um, you know, the cancers you know, if there, we see a clustering of cancer, we'd want to think that maybe, you know, there be, it's being caused by the same cause. Um, but sure, I mean, there are definitely people who come from a family that they do carry a mutation. And, um, you know, any woman can develop breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So it can also happen sporadically. So it is possible. Um, and, uh, you know, not, maybe not as likely, but certainly possible. Dr. Zorn, this question is, uh, what are the chances of developing breast cancer during treatment of ovarian cancer? I, um, I'm assuming that they're asking about in someone who carries a BRCA mutation um, and they find out that they have ovarian cancer, should they worry about breast cancer screening? Um, or prevention during their ovarian cancer treatment. That's a tricky area. There's not one right answer, but generally what I counsel my patients in that scenario is, in general, ovarian cancer is a life-threatening disease, and we focus on um, its risk while a person is in treatment. If a woman gets to a point that she's in remission from her ovarian cancer and she carries a BRCA mutation, she can certainly consider stepped-up screening for breast cancer, so to include an MRI, not just a mammogram. And I have had patients who've decided to go ahead and move forward with a prophylactic mastectomy, um, but that's a very personal decision, and I think it's really helpful to have a discussion with your GYN oncologist about how likely they think your ovarian cancer is to come back. Um, before you take that step. Because, you know, if you're already dealing with a life-threatening ovarian cancer, we don't want to put people through an extra screening or prevention surgery that may not really be what's going to take them out of the world eventually. So I think it's a very um, important decision that really needs to be based on a person's individual circumstances. We've got a minute left. Um, another question, what about communicating with family members if I have a gene mutation? I carry a BRC mutation, but I don't know how and when to tell my kids. So I'll actually take that. That's a great question. It's a very common um, question that I hear. Um, you know, communicating, like I said, you know, in genetics, obviously, we're dealing with family. You know, it's not just the one person because we inherit our genes and we pass them on. So obviously any information um, could be applicable to other at-risk family members. So definitely communicating can be a challenge. In terms of um, when, you know, Dr. Zorn mentioned we definitely in, this, in these situations would not want to test a minor, so definitely no younger than the age of 18. And then something else to consider is when would these medical recommendations begin? So with BRCA, typically we start uh, either, you know, discussion of screening or surgery at age 25. And so it really depends on who your child is as a person, who you are as a person, um, you know, how you communicate in your family. Um, and, you know, definitely I would recommend giving me a call or, you know, speaking with a genetic counselor to discuss strategies because, you know, I have a bunch of strategies under my belt and, and many genetic counselors do deal with that. Um, you know, even just what words do I use and how do I broach this overwhelming topic of bringing this up with my child. So, um, you know, and there are, there are useful techniques out there and, and uh, I definitely commend anyone who's thinking about it because it's not easy, um, but it, it is an important conversation to have. 
I do think one um, concept that I've found very helpful to a lot of my patients in this circumstance is it's very easy to say, oh my gosh, this is such a curse that my family has been found to carry a BRCA mutation. But those of us in the medical community who counsel folks actually feel a little bit the opposite. In, in many ways for us, it's a relief to be able to find an explanation for why these families have such terrible histories of cancer, and now we can do something to be proactive about it. We can do genetic testing to find out who carries the mutation and be proactive about trying to prevent their cancer or diagnose it as early as possible. Or we can also rule out the people in the family who don't carry the mutation and can now, you know, breathe a sigh of relief that they're back to the general population risk. They don't have these increased risks for breast and ovarian cancer. So to us, it's been an invaluable tool to try to help better counsel these families um, that we didn't have that, that tool in the past until genetic testing came along. Okay, two more questions. Um, um, is it possible to get ovarian cancer after a complete hysterectomy is done? It is possible to get um, cancer in a couple of mechanisms. Number one is if the fallopian tubes and ovaries weren't completely removed. And many women have heard that term, complete hysterectomy, but they don't really know the specifics of what parts were removed. So, for example, if part of the fallopian tube is left behind, it can develop cancer, just like if part of the ovary is left behind. But assuming the tubes and ovaries were really removed in their entirety, Peritoneal cancer is a cancer that can still develop. The peritoneum is the internal lining of the abdomen, and it develops a cancer that looks like and acts like and is treated just like ovarian cancer. So even in a woman who's had a BSO, there is a small risk of peritoneal cancer. That's why we can't promise 100% risk reduction for GYN cancer after the BSO, but it's quite protective, and that residual risk for peritoneal cancer is probably only about 1% to 2%. Okay, and um, one more question. Let's see. And I, I think this kind of tied up with uh, one of the questions I would ask in the beginning, but what do you recommend about lifestyle and environmental exposures that may affect risk for breast cancer or ovarian cancer? Well, I think um, there's a couple of ways to think about that. Um, number one, I think in the United States especially, we vastly underestimate the impact that we all have on our own health, especially our cancer risk by the decisions we make every day and our lifestyle choices. What I mean by that is um, eating um, fresh fruits and vegetables, eating whole grains, avoiding a lot of processed foods, maintaining a healthy body weight, limiting alcohol intake, avoiding cigarette smoking, healthy exercise habits, getting good sleep, trying to manage stress in our lives. And I know none of that is easy to do, but those are the decisions that we make every day that impact our cancer risk as well as our diabetes risk, our cholesterol risk, our heart health risk. So all of those things are wrapped up in trying to help us be as healthy as we can as we age. Um, those are the, the critical factors. I think beyond that, there are specific steps that people who are at an increased risk for cancer can take. So for example, if a woman is known to be at increased risk for breast cancer, she can take a medicine called tamoxifen that is remarkably successful at decreasing breast cancer risk. Um, birth control pills, as we mentioned, are remarkably successful at decreasing risk for not just ovarian cancer, but also colon cancer and endometrial cancer. So we really do have some strategies that probably need to be tailored to an individual circumstance, but we all have incredible power over our health with the decisions we make every day about how we live our lives. Great. We are over uh, five minutes after the hour, um, and I want to thank um, Danielle Singer with Cher Charette and Dr. Kristen Zorn um, with the University of Arkansas of Medical Science. Um, thank you so much for participating National Ovarian Cancer Coalition. Uh, Genetic Testing 101, um, I'd like to also thank our sponsors, Genentech and Myriad. And um, you will be, this uh, session has been taped, so you will be receiving a link after the session is over. Thank you very much.